Shalom, and welcome to Via Havta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. One of the predominant themes in this epistle to Titus is to contend for sound doctrine. We see that in the first chapter and in the chapter that we're going to study this evening. So with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the epistle to Titus in chapter 2. Now we're going to go through this second chapter very carefully. We want to be accurate, and therefore, we have to pay close attention to the vocabulary. We're going to see a few words repeat over and over. Secondly, not only is the vocabulary important, but how the Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul to construct these words, not just the order, but also the grammatical form that we find them. And it is so unfortunate that many translations do not pay attention to the grammar. And one of the things that we see that Paul is admonishing Titus to do is to provide truth to the people in order that they have sound revelation in order to base their life upon this truth in order that the outcome, and what outcome is Paul referring to? A testimony that is full of good works. A faith that does not change how we behave is not a biblically sound faith. It is not faith in Messiah Yeshua. When one believes in the Messiah, invites him into one's life, That means that the Holy Spirit, by faith in that gospel message, the Holy Spirit, He dwells in every believer, every disciple of Messiah Yeshua, that is Jesus Christ. And the outcome of the Holy Spirit is God's provision, God's power, and God bringing about perfection. That's the objective we need to remember that Messiah says, be perfect. Now, that is our objective. That is our goal. Do we fall short of that? Frequently, we do. But nevertheless, that is God's expectation for his people, that we be a holy people and that we be a people that reflect perfectly God's will. Well, as I said, let's begin in chapter 2 of Titus paying close attention to these words. Verse 1. But you say. Now, most translations do not begin with the word but. We've talked about how there's two primary conjunctions. Chi meaning and a simple and a congruent conjunction. And then one that shows a a difference, a a disconnect, an opposition, a contrast. And that is the conjunction day. To understand what's happening here, we need to remember what took place at the end of the first chapter. In that last verse, verse 16. Here, Paul was speaking about those who, even though they confess to know God, What's the problem? The problem is that these deny the power of God. They deny the evidence of God in their life because they do not do what they ought to do. They deny the works. That is the work of God 
through the believer's life, one who confesses God. Furthermore, it says these individuals being, and the word, and we talked about this, is a world word for repulsive. In simple English slang, we would say that which is gross, that which is unacceptable, that which is rejected. And that's what he's saying here. These individuals are rejected. And the reason for that, as we keep reading, is that they, instead of affirming and documenting in their behavior what is a good work, what do they do? The exact opposite. They are in opposition to the good work that is the ministry of the Holy Spirit who is the one that enables us to behave in a way that produces good fruit, good works, that which is pleasing to God. So it's with that in our memory that we can accurately understand what's happening in chapter 2 in this first verse. Paul is contrasting that type of behavior, denying God, His power, the evidence of his work in one's life through good works, documenting that in behavior. He's contrasting those who fail and reject that with Titus. Titus does indeed behave and, here's the key, but you are speaking those things. It's in the plural. And then the next word is a word that, that shows something which is fitting or appropriate titus he speaks the things that are fitting for something to be to be maintained or established and what is that well we look here that which is fitting for sound doctrine sound teaching now i mentioned that there's a few words that we're going to encounter several times in this epistle both in the first chapter and the second chapter and the word i'm referring to is the one where in chapter one paul tells titus to contend for sound doctrine and the word sound is the same word in greek that we get the english word hygiene from so when he says speak sound doctrine think of it this way it's keeping a spiritual hygiene what happens if we ignore hygiene well things such as bacteria and germs and disease plagues the person when you lack good hygiene you're going to soon be sick and your body is going to begin to be corrupt with disease and problems from that lack of hygiene well paul is saying the same principle spiritually when an individual when a group when a local congregation is not keeping spiritual hygiene that is sound doctrine that group that congregation those individuals are going to become sick spiritually and let me say with with all assurance when i look at the vast majority of movements within the so-called evangelical community i see a sick group those who are not fit those who are not embracing that which is appropriate according to sound doctrine according to scriptural truth so here in this first verse of chapter 2, he, he reiterates how important this is. But you, in contrast to those others, you are speaking those things that, that are, are relevant, pertinent, those things that produce sound doctrine. Look now to verse 2. We saw in the first chapter, that there was an emphasis on elders. Let me say that another way, leadership. And there should be male elders, and there should also be female elders. Now, they have a similar but 
unrelated position within a local assembly. He's talking primarily, if we go back to chapter 1, he says, set elders where? In every city. He's talking about a community right now. He's not talking about necessarily a local congregation. If you ask me, and I'm going to deal with this just so that, that it doesn't come up at a different times or people are un, unsure about my intent, in a congregation that has elders or deacons, is it appropriate for a female to serve in that capacity? The answer is biblically, no, it is not. A congregation that is embracing sound doctrine will not have female elders, that is, in the main leadership of their congregation. But there's going to be women and men that are older, the implication is wiser, that have a good reputation in that community, and they are going to provide great leadership and influence both in the congregation and in the community. That's their job. Not necessarily in some official title, but in a very practical way. And this is what he's talking about here within this community, within each and every city. So there can be women in a local congregation that are in the, the direction of leaders, not the primary leaders, but leaders of exactly what it says here. Because when we look at the next verse, we see that, that there should be elders, and first, it's speaking about men. And these elders who are men, and we know it's speaking about men because it's in the masculine, men who are sober-minded. Now, that speaks about one who has two characteristics. First of all, they are able to, with, with sober understanding, know what to do in a given situation. But that's only half of it. They are also vigilant in doing it, committed. They are alert to make sure that what needs to be done is done. This word has the same idea of someone watching, guarding, and waiting to respond. So it's just not a knowledge, it's also being diligent in responding to that situation. Again, verse, verse 2, elders who are sober-minded, they need to be sober-minded, and notice this next word, it is a word that that I believe is so necessary and so neglected today, and that is serious. They need to be serious-minded. I've said many times one of the great problems is when we deal with doctrine that people are too casual, flippant with the faith. So we need to be serious-minded in when one is a leader to display those things in a very, very committed fashion, serious fashion, that keeping what is right, appropriate, fitting for the people of God. Not only that, there's another word that is mentioned here, and this is a word that speaks, most scholars see it as exemplifying or demonstrating self-control. And by the way, this word, remember, I said that there was a few words that repeat in this uh, epistle, but primarily tonight in our study. One was that word for sound doctrine. Remember, it's where we derive the word hygiene from. Well, the second word is this word, that which relates to self-control, not succumbing to temptation, not being one easily drawn with the crowd, but is willing to, and here's the key, willing to stand alone. And this word in this, this chapter, in the 15 verses of this chapter, this word appears five times. So it's 
emphasize it's important. So these elders are supposed to be sound mind, that is sober, vigilant, and also serious minded, and then also under self-control for what purpose? Well, now we see that same word for sound, remember hygiene. It says sound for the faith, meaning faith is related to truth. They are individuals that when we look at the truth, they do not corrupt it, but they are committed to it. So sound for the faith and for love. Now, this word love, many of you know the Greek word agape, love, it's a sacrificial one. It is one that denies self in order, in order to be a blessing, a help for someone else. And the motivation for doing so is nothing personal. It is because we're moved by compassion that God put his love in us, therefore we love others. And because we have experienced God's love, love, we love him. And our motivation is to be pleasing to him and a blessing to others with no expectation or desire for anything in this world. Our emphasis is on the coming age, the kingdom of God. We want to store up rewards there, nothing for this present time. So, elders they need to be sober-minded also serious under self-control and sound for the faith and love and notice that last word some bibles will translate it patient but it's a word for for enduring it's a word of perseverance and that's so important and i think that there is a connection between why it says love and the next phrase perseverance when you love there is that commitment remember we talked in a recent message maybe what we talked about in chapter one or another message that i gave very recently about how in first corinthians 13 it talks about love endures all things why because it's committed love is a quality that pers perseveres and over comes and that's what he's talking about if we have sound faith it will manifest itself in love and endurance move on to verse verse 3 now we have elders but we don't have we don't have the masculine but we have feminine and this could be the wives of the elders that's how some interpret it others interpret about simply older women who serve in a very important capacity so also female elders similarly in what's that next word in behavior you cannot study this second chapter in fact you can't study much of the bible and not come away with obedience is important to god obedience that manifests itself in behavior now again I always say because when I don't, I get questions. We're not saved by our obedience. Our behavior does not uh, play a role in our salvation. It is a gift. It's rooted in grace based upon nothing that we have done, but what we receive by faith. But having believed, having received faith, the outcome of that faith is going to be a changed behavior. And what Paul is saying and admonishing Titus, that, that Titus, you, you instruct these female elders, these older women, that they need to have a certain behavior. Their faith should impact how they behave, and they should be, and the first word is a root, which speaks about uh, the priesthood or the temple, or I think believe, other translations will say that which is sacred. The next word is the same word that we encountered 
going back up to verse 1, where it says, but you are speaking the things which are appropriate or fitting. So what Titus is saying to these female elders, these older women who are going to have influence in the community or in the local congregation, he is saying to them, you need to have an appropriateness, a fittingness in your behavior that shows a commitment to that which is sacred. Sacred related to the worship and the service of God. So these are very serious. They're very specific uh, qualifications that, that Titus is instructing. And then he says, not diabolos. Now what's that? Well, many translations will say not slandering, but it's the same word for devil. And this word devil means kind of conniving. It's the closest English word is the word diabolical. And what it means is not conspiring to achieve something. See, the devil, he conspires, he's diabolical, he's, he's uh, scheming. Why? For his own purpose. He's also slanderous. But here the point is that, that these women who are going to have an influence, and we'll talk about where their influence should be in a moment. They should not be slandering. They should not be conspiring for their objectives. But what are they concerned with? What he's already mentioned twice, and that is sound doctrine. They, too, are called to contend. And that is a word of conflict, it is a word of, of warfare, contend for sound doctrine. So look once more, middle of verse, verse 3, that they are not uh, conspiring, not slanderous, and not uh, in bondage, having been made in bondage to strong wine. Now, this word can mean much wine, but we have to remember something. More often than not, wine was diluted there was a necessity for for clean beverages to drink and wine was frequently used but diluted very significantly and what it's saying here is that this should not be one who has been given over to enslaved and that's exactly what that word is having been enslaved by strong wine so they don't have that issue in their life but rather what are they doing they are those that are teaching those who are teaching what is well what is good what is the will of god so they're affirming that which is proper good doctrine. Verse 4. In order that, why do they do this? Well, now we're going to find their motivation, their objective. What should be the, the objective that they have in being this group of female elders? In order that, notice what it says. It's the third time that this word for self-control. Now remember this. Five times in this chapter, Paul is going to remind Titus of how important it is for individuals, so much more so leaders within the community, to demonstrate self-control. And again, what is that? Not being pulled away, tempted and doing the things that that temptation leads to, entice to. Being an individual that is not uh, pulled away by the majority or by what's popular or because of a desire to be popular. No, a leader, he's committed to something that sound doctrine, and he's willing to contend, she's willing to contend by herself, by himself. And that's why we see today 
that, that many times, especially politically speaking, people make decisions not based upon right and wrong, but based upon, well, the people won't like that. This won't be well received. This is not how other, thing, other people are doing it in other places, other countries. It doesn't matter. We need to be committed to sound doctrine. And that's what he's saying here. And to do so, we have to be people who are self-controlled. So once more, verse, verse 5 it says here, in order that they be of, of self-control, who be? The younger women. So these female elders are going to have influence in order that these younger women, that they demonstrate self-control and they do something. They love their husbands to be lovers of their husbands and lovers of children. Now, the word here for love is not the same word. It's not the word agape, but it's the word philo, which means to be endeared to to like and they're supposed to demonstrate in behavior that they like their husbands that they like their children and i've been told that this word has contained in its meaning not in its etymology but in its meaning a degree of joy and that makes sense because the things that you like they give you joy we know sometimes agape love is a sacrificial love and there's not a joy initially that comes from that. That's not what the motivation is. It's obedience. It's a love for God that draws you to behave in a certain way. But here it's to show self-control and to demonstrate a, a liking of one's husbands and one children. And then he goes on to say here in our, our passage that also, look now to verse 5. This is the, the, now the third time, it was earlier in verse 4, it was the second time that this word sound mind, now it's the third time. To be sound-minded, pure, and this is a word which means to do deeds at the home. Then the word good, which means in regard to God's will. And notice, immediately after this word good, which relates to God's will, it says, being in subjunction, subjection to one's own husband. Now, I want to point out here this word to be in subjunction, subjection to. It has to do with submissiveness. It has to do with recognizing authority and this word appears and i wrote it down here 38 times in the new covenant 38 times and if you go through which i have done and look at each of these times it shows one who subjects himself to another because it's the right thing to do let me give you an example in the Gospel of Luke, this word is used in regard to Messiah. Messiah who subjected himself, submitted himself to his parents. Now let me ask you, who was greater? He was. He's the Son of God. But nevertheless, because it was right in God's eyes, God's program, the purposes of God for a son to acknowledge the authority of his parents messiah he humbled himself and did that and in that same way we're not saying the woman is less but we're saying that biblically look again what it says going back to verse five to be sound minded or excuse me to be uh, self-controlled pure a keeper of the home doing deeds of the house also that which is good 
And then it says, to be in submissiveness to one's own husbands. Now, how to understand this? Here again, if you look at these 38 different times, we see something. It is not speaking about one who is less than. We've already demonstrated that. But it's one who humbles himself, herself, recognizing authority for the purpose of God to be met. Not the purpose, not the purpose of the individual that this one subjects himself to. I want to say that again. The purpose is the will of God to be realized. It is not for one who is in the authority for them to get whatever they want or whatever there's right. So when a woman submits to her husband, it's always, it's always, it's always for the will of God to be manifested. That's what the scripture is teaching us. And look at something else here. As we go on, it says, to her own husbands, meaning this. She is supposed to behave in a way that it produces God's will in her own husband. Very important. That is her objective. That is her sphere of influence, not to another individual. Second part in verse 5, why do that? In order that the word of God is not blasphemy. So let me just say something. When a wife refuses to submit in the things of God for God's will in regard to her husband, she is blaspheming the word of God, the order of God. It is vital that we see this. Now, I want to give an example because oftentimes people, if we don't see something, feel something, touch something, we, we won't be committed to it. Seeing is believing for many. That's not how it should be, but it is. But I want to give you an example. Recently, I was reading about a devastating fire that took place in California. Now, this was a few years ago, not recently, but a few years ago. I was reading about it recently. And it talks about one individual who had a cigarette, threw it on the ground, went back and couldn't find it where it was. He threw it, the wind blew it, and he had not put it out. And he says to himself, ah, that little action brought about a strong forest fire that brought about the destructions of homes. I don't remember how many homes, some businesses, and a lot of destruction of land. The outcome of just that simple, careless action that had quite a bit of influence because it brought about a great amount of damage and financial loss. We don't know sometimes what a little action we see as insignificant, won't cause a problem. Well, I can't get to it right now, so I'll just let it be. And we don't know what the outcome's going to be. And I would say that that is so true in regard to when someone will not submit to God's order within the home, within the family. So it says, be in subjection to one's own husband in order that not the word of God should be blasphemy. Now, verse 6. The younger men similarly. Now, here it goes back to instead of the older women teaching the younger women, now we have it. In a grammatical construction, the word for encouraging, exhorting, is in the third person singular. So it's not uh, the elder women doing it, but it's in regard to Titus. That Titus is being taught to similarly, in regard to the young men, exhort them to be, and here's the fourth time, exhort them to be, 
he says, of, of self-control. Over and over we see self-control being admonished to the reader of this, verse 7. And concerning everything of yourself, every aspect of your life, he's telling, Peter, Paul is telling Titus, concerning all things of yourself, hold to, be, in other words, take heed to be a good, to be an example of good works. Now, think of that, that concerning everything of yourself. Take heed. Be an example of good works. In order that, and here it is, the doctrine, the teaching, the truth of Scripture, in order that the truth of Scripture might be maintained. In doctrine, and then there's, in the Texas Receptives, there are three words. In the Nestle Allen, which most of your Bible translations, if you're not using the King James, it will follow the Nestle Allen, and it'll only have two words. But let's go back and see what he's saying here once more. Look at verse, verse 7. He says, concerning all things of yourself, Basically, be kept, take heed to be an example of good works in the teaching of right doctrine so that there won't be that which is what? Well, the three words is the word, first word is that which is uncorrupted. We don't want things to be corrupt. That is to turn away from the truth. And then we have the word for that which is serious. So maintain through teaching, doing good deeds, make sure that there's not that which is corrupt sneaking into the congregation. Rather, he says, you need to be serious. Some Bibles translate this with dignity. And dignity is simply behaving in a way that's, that's serious, that's right, that's proper, for a given situation. And then if you all are following the Texas Receptus, it has a similar word for that which is not corruptible, that we saw the first word, but here it's a word that I think some Bibles translate it sincere, but something that is, that is genuine, not a false representation, not a counterfeit. So he says, our faith, what we teach, has to be that which is not corruptible, that which is serious, and that which is genuine. That's what he's looking for. And all of that comes about only, only, only when there is a strong commitment to the truth of Scripture. And we become alert, vigilant, in spiritual hygiene that's the implication now let's move to to verse 8 verse 8 begins with a word of soundness now it's that same word in abbreviated form for hygiene so a sound word he wants us to be speakers of. He's telling, Paul's telling Titus, speak this sound word and, and do so in a way that's beyond reproach in order that the one who is against, the one who is contrary, one from the other side, the, the antagonistic view, in order that one who is contrary shall be ashamed and nothing should he have concerning you to say which is derogatory, that which is evil, that which is slanderous. Now, I think this is so vital that we see that the leadership is supposed to be an individual 
that does what? That speaks sound doctrine. That is beyond reproach, what he says, and his behavior. In order that those who are antagonistic, those who are contrary to the, the truth of God, the will of God, that such a person be ashamed and has nothing. And what's emphasized here is nothing. Literally the word order, nothing having concerning you to speak derogatory. Verse 9. Now, verse 9 deals with biblical servanthood. And, and what I'm speaking about, I'll use the word slavery. But it's very, very important that we don't get confused. See, many times we allow our, our background, our culture, our life experience, our education to influence what we read and how we understand it. This has nothing, when we talk about slavery in the Bible, it has nothing whatsoever to do with with the slavery that's practiced in many places even today where you, you take someone by force, you enslave them and make them do whatever you want, whatever it is. We see that in sex trafficking and human trafficking of a wide variety. And of course, slavery, that if you are from America, you know about slavery, the plantations and such, where individuals, because of having a a darker skin, were enslaved just for that reason. We're not talking about this. This is servanthood for what purpose? Well, in the Bible, it has to do with someone becoming a bond servant. And what is that? Well, remember the word bond. They had a debt they could not pay. Therefore, they have to serve their creditor. That's the implication. And what does he say here? Well, as people of sound faith, we don't try to get away from our debts. We honor our obligations. That's what the emphasis here of this ninth verse. So it says, slaves, one own master. And the word here for master simply means one who has a secular authority or authority of some other variety. But in this context, it's a secular authority, not a spiritual. Slaves, one own masters, and it's the same word, submit to. Now, it has nothing to do with one is of more value or another. It has to do with one thing. An individual is is brought into a relationship where that relationship demands that one has authority over another. And this is what it's saying here. You are to subject yourself in all things, and here's the key, to be well-pleasing. Now, well-pleasing is a very important word. It's well-pleasing, and the context for this word is what is well-pleasing to God, that you do the right thing always in this situation, that you understand that your subjection to that earthly authority is to be well-pleasing to God. And that's what we saw about subjection in general, when one subjects themselves to another. Read again verse 9. Slaves to one owns master be subjected to, subject yourself to, in everything to be well-pleasing. And not, and here's something, not to be, contrary now i believe the old uh the king james the earliest king james has gainslayer which is simply saying something to be contrary to 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 be in an antagonistic point of view we should not do that that is not what one of faith behaves verse 10 not and this is a word for See, we're supposed to be adding, not subtracting. 
And the, the second word in this, this 10th verse is a word that means do not be subtracting. Don't take something and make it less than, not as, as good as it was. We should have a positive influence. When we get involved, we should add, add worth, add value, add a spiritual pleasing dimension to it. That's what it's saying, being a positive influence. So he says the opposite. He says, don't be subtracting, but he says, demonstrate, show, manifest good faith. And the implication is in all things, in every aspect, good things, good faith in order, in order that the teaching, the doctrine of God our Savior now we need to pause for a moment because when we look at the grammatical construction and you'll recall that I said it's so important for us to understand the the vocabulary the grammatical construction the word order all the clues of the text in order to arrive at a proper understanding now when someone says and I hear this all the time when someone says the Bible doesn't speak about about Yeshua being God yes it does many many places the problem is that people are not trained in the scripture to see it when it, it jumps out of the page look at this and he's going to say it twice in in the next few verses but look at where we are in the verse 10 in order that the teaching of God the doctrine of God and then it says our Savior so our Savior is God very important that we see this now someone might say well sure God is the one that had the plan he's the one that commanded Yeshua Hold on, we're going to see how it gets very specific. But here, our Savior is God. And the teaching of God, our Savior. And then we have the word, it's the word cosmos. Now, most of you know the word cosmos. Many people would say, well, it speaks about the universes or all the universes. The, 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 all the galaxies, the entire world, all of creation. I believe there was a, a scientist, Carl Sagan, he would say that the cosmos, and he would use always that word, is full of billions and billions of galaxies and stars and so forth. Well, he may have had a lot of, of education. He might have been a revered scientist, but he didn't know the language that he was using. Because the word cosmos is of the Greek origin. It's a Greek word that was brought into English. And the word cosmos, if you look, oftentimes it's just a, a simple uh, a biblical dictionary. It will just say, well, it's a word for the world. That's not enough. That's, that's inadequate. The word cosmos speaks about creation but it's related to the concept of order, bringing things into order. So in the Greek New Testament, when it speaks about the world, there's never, never a moment where scripture speaks about the world and it doesn't speak about a world that has order. Now, by the way, that same word cosmos can be used for that which is uh, decorative or that which is adoring meaning when something is of perfect order you look at something here my my wife is preparing in front of me you can't see her but i can and as i record this she is setting the table because we're going to have a holiday meal we're recording this before the conference a few weeks and i see her doing it and when everything's in order, everything that's necessary, everything's in its right place, it's beautiful. There is an adornment. There's a decoration because 
everything is fitting. That's the word cosmos. So what he says here is this, that when, look at that verse again, when we are not, add, we're not subtracting, but we're adding to that, which makes for uh, good faith, manifesting the good faith, it is going to be for that teaching, that doctrine which is proper, the doctrine of God, our Savior, and it's going to put in order. It's going to adorn. It's going to decorate. It's going to put in order because it's the same word for cosmos. Put in order all things. Now, we're getting into a very important section of chapter 2. And that is speaking about grace, the purpose of grace, and the outcome ultimately of grace. And realize something. There is a relationship between the grace of God and the will of God. I want to receive God's grace because it produces the will of God in my life. I hear a lot of people talking about, about grace. But seldom do I ever hear someone properly say that the grace of God which saves us but it also it also produces the will of God and that's one of the things we're going to see in this next verse look if you would to verse verse 11 for the grace of God and if your Bible says has appeared or is manifested it misses a very, very important truth. Again, grammar is important. When you look at this word that's manifested, appeared, however it's translated in your Bible, it's fine, as long as it does so in the passive. It's in the passive voice. Now, what is that? Something caused it, something acted in order that the grace of God would be made to appear, would be visible, would be made manifest. And I looked at 29 different translations. And one, which is a horrible translation by and large, it's a paraphrase, it gets it very accurate. I would tell you what paraphrase, but I don't want to give it any credence at all, so I won't. But the only other of the 29 the only other one was Young's literal translation. It did the time to actually translate it and show that that something makes the grace of God to appear, to be manifested. It doesn't happen on its own. Something has to cause God's grace to appear. So once more, verse 11, for the grace of God has been manifested. And then we have the word. It's simply salvation. Most of the time it's translated brain salvation. Now, why isn't literally the word braining there? And I realize if you go to a strong concordance, it'll have brain salvation because of this verse. But if you look at every other place that this word for salvation in this form appears, never, ever, ever, only here does it have the translation bringing salvation the purpose of just saying salvation is to show the close relationship between grace and salvation without grace there is no salvation now in an understanding way it's fine to say bringing salvation the grace of God has appeared been made to appear caused to appear been manifested made to be manifested and this has brought salvation. That's true. But the grammar wants to emphasize to the reader the, the close connection, the inherent relationship between grace and salvation. And look that this salvation is for all men, meaning all people, men and women alike, and Jew and Gentile. No one is excluded here. And that's why when you are part of a false teaching, 
and that is a limited atonement that Messiah only died for some and not all. There are so many scriptures that says that that is a false teaching. I was listening, for example, to uh, John MacArthur, and he was talking, and of course, our conference that we're doing virtually is uh, uh, during the corona time. Normally, I don't like to bring time elements into book study, but the example is, he was teaching, and he says, you know, it's not my responsibility to worry about whether someone gets the disease or not. That's up to God. Now, he's of the mindset of a predetermination. His view of sovereignty of God is a false view of the sovereignty of God. What he's saying is what will be is, and there's nothing we can do about it. Our job, he says, is to preach the gospel. That's true. But we also have the responsibility not, and we'll just take this in a general sense, not to do something that can injure someone. Now, I'm taking away from the coronavirus, but just in general. We, if we violate the word of God, that is, if we sin, the outcome is frequently, usually, an outcome that is not God's will, and that does not impact adversely the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. God does not lead me or anyone to murder someone. Now, he may, a soldier, lead to kill. He may have a police officer to defend someone, have to take another life. But, but I use the term murder. God never leads. It's never God's will for someone to murder. Now, can God find glory in that and change all things to good? Yes, he can. He's sovereign. But do not think, well, this person was murdered and just God's will. No, sin is never God's will. But sin does not thwart God's will. God still can find glory. God still can use that for his purpose. So here we have to realize something very important. When it says, for the grace of God has uh, been made to appear, salvation, the outcome of that is salvation for all men, potentially. That's God's will, that all would be saved, not just a limited group. And what else does grace do? Grace just doesn't save us, but it teaches us that we should deny the ungodliness. Now, the definite articles there, those things, everything, and the definite article makes it emphatic. That we should deny, work against, move away from, not be associated with, that which is ungodly. And all, he says, and the worldly desires. Now, this is the same word for cosmos in a different form. It's the word cosmos in a different grammatical form. But here, it's talking about there's two orders. There's the order of the world, and there's the order of God. When God created the world, ultimately, those six days of creation, at the end he says, behold, it is tov me'od, very good. Sin impacted this world, stained this world. Sin corrupts this world. Don't blame God. Man, I'm guilty, you're guilty, humanity is. And, and there's an order of a sin-stained world, and there's an order of a holy kingdom and what he's saying here is that we need to be people we need to be people that that do indeed follow follow that which is a kingdom order and not the ways of the world and the and it's simply desires i realize some bibles will say lust but it's the desires and if you understand lust as just a strong desire then it's fine the lust of the world but rather we should be Here's the fifth and final time we should be people of self-control and righteous and godly. That is a word for pious. It's a word that describes a godly behavior. So notice again, the grace of God teaches us to deny everything that's ungodly 
and everything that's rooted in the desires of the world's order. Rather, we're supposed to be self-controlled and righteous. Very important word. How do I know what righteous is? The commandments of God teach us that. And that's why when, when someone ignores the commandments of God, and I'm talking about the Torah commandments, the law of God, they will not have the vantage point to understand that which is pleasing, that which is good, that which is righteous. And I'll come to that in just a moment. So he says, teaching us to deny ungodliness and the desires of the world, and instead of that, to show self-control and righteousness and godliness living now in this age. And there's an emphasis on now in this present age. So grace just doesn't have a, a purpose when I die that I enter into the kingdom of God. But grace also has a purpose that teaches me that I must be committed to that which is godly, that which is righteous, and, as he says here, that which is of, of God's character, God's order, his ways. Living in this present world. Verse, verse 13. Verse 13 and 14 and 15 are, are some of my favorite verses. Now, it's interesting. In verse 13, we're going to encounter a an event what is that event the blessed hope the rapture and and so frequently so frequently when i i discuss that issue with people they never come to titus chapter 2 13. they just leave that verse out of the equation and it's such an important verse look at verse 13 some will have waiting or looking towards. It's a word of expectation. If we look at it, it's a word for welcoming something to, meaning someone's coming, I want to welcome them, and I come to them. It is an excitement. And I ask the question, why, in speaking about the blessed hope, does Paul use the verb here in regard to welcoming to, meaning welcoming someone by coming to them there is an anticipation there is an expectation and that's because as the blessed hope the rapture comes closer we're going to see no one knows the day or the hour but but based upon the events there's going to be a heightened expectation so welcoming to the blessed hope and and notice What's the blessed hope here? Well, it is the, the appearing. And remember I talked about the divinity of Messiah? Well, here's the second time because it says the appearing of, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach. So now, and this is something that's so important, we need to take the time to learn it. Because if we go back up to a previous verse, when it talked about our Savior, I'm speaking of, of verse 10, where it talks about, in order that the doctrine of our God and our Savior. And someone, and I have debated people on the divinity of Messiah. Obviously, I believe that Messiah is God. And therefore, you go to this verse and they'll say, oh, no, it's God, our Savior. Well, that is a possible, a reasonable conclusion. But it's wrong in, in this sense because when you go down, and this is where Scripture interpreting Scripture, when we come to verse 13, it tells us that, that there's a glorious appearing manifestation. And by the way, that word manifestation is in the singular. So one of the things we also have to ask is, why is this word for appearing? It's not the appearings of God and our Savior, Messiah, Yeshua. But it's one appearing. And in Greek as such, if it's speaking about two individuals, it has to take a plural. 
So the significance of the singular is, is of the greatest value for interpretive purposes. And the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Messiah Yeshua. Now he's going to tell us how he's the Savior. What did he do? And this also clarifies that God, even though it was God's purpose, even though we can say God's our Redeemer, but it's Messiah that did the work. He is the Savior. How did he do it? Look at verse 14. Who gave himself, it's already been done, who gave himself in behalf of us in order to redeem us. And this redemption is from every, and pay attention to this last wow, word, I believe it's, no, it's the middle word, uh, middle of verse 14. Pay attention to this next word. It's the word, let me say it in Greek. It's the word anomias. The word nomos is the word law or Torah. And when you put an alpha in front of it, it negates it. So it's lawlessness. Now, the King James, and I like the King James translation. I like the Greek text that it's based upon. But I believe if my memory serves me right, that is that we're talking about in the King James iniquity. That is a incorrect translation. Many other translations get it right. It is a word for lawlessness. So notice what it's saying here. Messiah, he gave himself in order to redeem us, not just to bring us into the kingdom of God. That's a big, big part of it but also redeem us from all, unlaw all lawlessness, everything that is against the Torah. Now, there's no way that someone can remove themselves from that. The redemption of Messiah, he shed his blood in order that I would not be against the Torah. Now, can we keep the law and it's, it's written for him today. No, there's many reasons why we can't, won't go into them. But we, by means of the Holy Spirit, which is the outcome of being redeemed, we can fulfill the righteousness of the law. And I don't believe it's an accident that in the previous verse we have righteousness, and now we're talking about the law. He's redeemed us from everything that is against Torah truth, in other words. And why did he do that? Well, if you are against the Torah, you are not going to be someone who is being cleansed, that you should be cleansed by, that he should cleanse for himself. And notice this, a peculiar people, a treasured people. Let me give you a verse. This word that appears here in the Greek text is, is a, the Greek version of a word that appears in the book of Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5. I want you to look at that verse sometime. Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5. Where it speaks about how God through our response to his revelation. That he is going to make us. It says in verse 6. A kingdom of priests. A holy nation. But in the previous verse. The one I'm talking about now. Verse 5. It says. Am segula. What's segula? a treasured people, but it's also a unique treasure. It's a peculiar people, unique, different than the world. So it says in order to redeem us from all lawlessness and he should cleanse for himself a, a treasured people. And what is this treasured people? What is, how do you know that if you are a treasured people, here it is. Look at the end of verse 14. Zealous for good works. Now, I'm sorry. You cannot say, I've received redemption, but the Torah is irrelevant. And, and good works, I, I don't want to be legalistic. Let me tell you. If you're not committed to doing good works, you have not understood the gospel. And there's a highly likely situation that, that you have, have trusted in an incorrect gospel, one that has been watered down so much that it doesn't even save. 
Now, I'm not trying to put doubt. I'm trying to be cautious. I don't want to stand before God and God say, you didn't really encourage the people in a way that brought them to make a biblical commitment to my message of salvation. So let me just read these words again. What does it say here? That Messiah has redeemed us from all lawlessness, everything that's against the Torah. And why did he do that? In order to cleanse for himself a treasured people, a peculiar people. And what makes us treasured to God and what makes us peculiar? That we are zealous for good works. And what is the word good? In accordance with his will. Let me tell you, when I look at most of what's passing for Christianity today, it, it does not live up to this, this definition, this bar. It falls far short. In fact, much of it is in opposition. What am I saying this for? Because we need to be sober-minded, diligent. We need to be individuals, individuals that contend for sound doctrine. Well, one more verse, and we'll conclude. Verse 15. These things he speaks. Paul is saying, I know you, Titus. I know that these things... He speaks and he exhorts. This is a word for providing encouragement, but exhorting in a very strong way. And also, it's a word for reproof. This is a word which means to convict someone that is, is not maintaining God's standards and even, even administer punishment. So he says, these things speak and exhort and reprove with all, and notice this, with all authority. Why does he say that? Because when we do that, God gives us his authority for his purpose and his will. Do these things, he's saying, speak, exhort, reprove with all authority and no one you allow to, to think less of. I believe most translations say despise, but it's simply a word to think little of, not to see significance in you. Don't let anyone say that what you're doing is insignificant. Doesn't matter. These are strong words that Paul gave to Titus, and I believe that they are desperately needed for for believers for the congregation to redeem for the assemblies evangelical congregations that they need to embrace these things well i've gone longer than i should may god richly bless you until our next session and we study chapter three of titus shalom from israel well we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Shalom from Israel.